Good morning. You guys doing okay? You good? I don't know how much you guys pay attention to those those uh, transitional videos. The the last one, the you know, the piano kind of lingered, and it gave me like this really smooth transition from the video to me, and that one kind of ends abruptly. And I feel like it's anticlimactic. You know, I have this great video, goes dark, lights come up. It's just me. You know, it's like, uh, oh, yeah, that's that guy again. You know, so. Uh, just kind of stand up here awkwardly. So good to see you guys. Glad you guys are here. Is it raining outside? Sort of. Yeah, we had, we had a good day yesterday. I hope you made it outside. Um, I've been living in Tennessee since, I don't know, I've been living in, in Murfreesboro since 1998, and I cannot remember a summer when it was like 70 degrees consistently in the middle of June. It's weird. It's depressing. And uh, it is. You guys are weirdos if you don't think it is. Um, it's not summer if you don't have weird tan lines on your feet and get to you know mow your grass in your tank top. But uh, I'm not saying I do that. Some of you <laughs> may want to mow your grass in your tank top. But um, yeah, anyways, all right, I'm going to stop talking. Uh, move on to the Word. So we are working through the Gospel of John. If you've never been here before, this is what we do. We, we take a book of the Bible and we go through word for word all the way through in We've been in John for a while. We've still got a couple of chapters to go. And we're in a very, um, it's a very interesting part of the Gospel of John. It's a very, very important part. It's, it's predominantly Jesus talking. And, and where we are in the story of the Gospel of John is Jesus is about, he's within 24 hours of being arrested and crucified. So in chapters 14 and 15, Jesus just wraps up dinner, the Last Supper, with his Disciples, Judas has already left. He's going to go betray Jesus. They're finishing up dinner. And Jesus, at the end of chapter 14, says, let's go for a walk. And, and he's talking to his disciples. And what he's essentially doing is Jesus is trying to imagine if, if you had people that followed you, you knew that you were about to get arrested and killed and with, within a 24-hour period, and you wanted to get all of this information kind of last minute to your followers. So he is cramming all the things he's been teaching them for years, kind of in this very compact lesson. And if you'll notice in chapters 14, 15, 16, and even 17, Jesus talks uh, 99% of the time. There may be little questions here and there, but it's him trying to reiterate all this information to them. In chapter 15, as they're walking around the garden, they're talking, they're in a vineyard, and, and he tells them this, this very figurative lesson. He says that, that I am the vine and you are the branches. And, and he's giving them this lesson that they have to live in him. They have to be in him in order to flourish, in order to, to be what God wants them to be, in order to be saved and changed and redeemed. They have to be in this vine. And he continues to talk. And in chapter 16 that we're doing today is just the continuation of that same conversation. But after talking about being in that vine, he's gonna bring up two really important things that we're gonna talk about today. Very, very, very important things. Very important for us today as Christians, if you're a Christian here. If you're not, hopefully this will, this will encourage you to, to look into it. He's gonna talk about that if we are in that vine, we receive clarity, clarity, and we receive courage. Clarity and courage. Two things that seem to be missing a lot nowadays. And, and this is what we're going to talk about today, clarity and courage. So you should have got a notes handout when you walked in. Everything I'm going to say will be in there. Everything will be on the, the, the jumbotron behind me here and on the sides. Uh, I, I say funny things and then I lose my train of thought. You should have, I said notes up there, yes. On the app, click on sermon notes. Everything is right there. If you have a Bible, we're in the fourth book of the New Testament, and we're going to be in the 16th chapter. We'll get through it relatively quick. It's not long. Um, but it's very important. And, and I'm going to go ahead and just kind of preface. It ends very, very encouraging. But we got to get through some dark stuff to get to that encouragement at the end. Okay? Uh, but we'll work through that. And then it ends in a very strong, uh, strong verse. Okay? So let me pray. We'll dive into John chapter 16. We'll see where the Lord takes us. Okay? Uh, thank you guys for being here. I don't mean that, you know, lackadaisically. I, I, I do appreciate it. I know you're all busy, um, but this is imperative, and I'm, I'm glad that you guys make it a point to be at church. I think it's very, very important. So let me pray for you, and let's jump into the Word. Father God, we love you. 
Lord, thank you for everyone in this room. Thank you that, that they've made it a, an important part of their life, God, to, to come to worship, to be with other believers, to, to break open your word and study it. And because of that, Lord, I just, I just pray that you bless this church today. We don't only pray for our church, though, Father. We pray for every church in our city. We pray for our other campuses and the churches in those cities. We pray, God, for our great nonprofits. And Lord, ultimately, our prayer is that, that everything we do today, that it honors you, that it blesses your kingdom, Lord, that it brings us closer to you. God, keep your hand on us, Lord. We love you. We thank you and pray all these things in your name, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, let's do chapter 16. Let's read a little bit and we'll go back and we'll break it down, okay? I have told you these things to keep you from stumbling. They will ban you from the synagogues. In fact, a time is coming when anyone who kills you will think he is offering service to God. They will do these things because they haven't known the Father or me. But I have told you these things so that when their time comes, you will remember I told them to you. I didn't tell you these things from the beginning because I was with you. But now I'm going away to him who sent me. And not one of you asks, where are you going? Yet, because I have spoken these things to you, sorrow has filled your heart. Nevertheless, I am telling you the truth. It is for your benefit that I go away. Because if I don't go away, the counselor will not come to you. If I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin, because they don't believe in me. About righteousness, because I'm going to the Father, and you will no longer see me. And about judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. Remember that. I still have many things to tell you, but you can't bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but he will speak whatever he hears. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. This is why I told you that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Okay, so the first four verses of this chapter are prophetic. It's a fancy word for just saying there are foretelling things that are going to happen in the future. Now, when Jesus says that there's going to be suffering, they're going to kick you out of the synagogues, they're going to physically hurt you, he was talking about two different time periods. For the disciples, there was the near future, which was going to be the persecution from the Roman government. After the church is established in Acts chapter 2, the Roman government will officially persecute Christians. And they will do this for about 300 years until Constantine became a Christian. People argue if he really did or not, but whether he did or not, he stopped persecution of the Christians. So, so for about 300 years, there was persecution against the Christians under the Roman government. That's what he's talking about in one sense. The other sense that he's talking about is there will always be persecution of Christians. So Jesus was saying from here on out, there will be persecution of my followers. So what we learn from that is something very important. Suffering and persecution is part of the Christian experience. It always has been, and it always will be. And I know that that's a tough thing to hear, but it's, but it's a true statement, and it's been proven over history, and it was taught by Jesus. So Christian have, uh, ha, Christians have and will always suffer. We will suffer in two ways. The first way, Jesus says they will kick you out of the synagogues. They will ban you from the synagogues. Now, the synagogues in Jewish culture was the center of society. So it wasn't necessarily a religious thing that Jesus was talking about. Jesus was saying, without being able to go into the synagogue, you would have no friends. You would have no family. You would have no social life whatsoever. So he says they will ban you from society. He also says they will physically hurt you. So here's what Jesus is doing. At this point right here that we're studying, it was a quiet time. The, the, sorry for the crudeness. The, the crap hadn't hit the fan yet, right? It's coming, but it hasn't hit yet. So before the, 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 the crap hits the fan, Jesus was preparing them for that turbulence. And we should learn from that. Let me tell you why. I, there is nothing about American culture right now that I would call peaceful, per se. 
But we live in a time where we have access to the word of God. You can order, you know, 65 different colors and 30 different translations and all kind of off Amazon and get a, a Bible shipped to your house. So we have access to the word of God. We have access to church. We can do what we're doing right now. We can walk down the street and sing worship songs and read the word of God, right? We can do that. We have the freedom to do that. So it would make a whole lot of sense to, to me, and I'm sure to you too, because you're intelligent people, that in these times where we have that freedom, before the storm comes, before the times come when maybe we do not have these freedoms, we should prepare our hearts for the things that lie ahead. Thank you. This is why the Bible says in Hebrews that the closer and closer Jesus' return comes, we should be doing this, not forsaking the assemblies of ourselves together, that we should be doing this more and more and more until he comes back. The reason why the Bible says that is because Jesus also alludes that it will get more and more complicated and more difficult as his return gets closer. So we should use these times to our advantage. So Jesus was going away, and this made the disciples really, really upset. Right? Of course, right? You know, you're leaving, we're going to miss you. But here's the thing. If Jesus didn't leave in physical body, he couldn't return in spirit. And, and the problem was this. The disciples were thinking selfishly. They're like, man, why are you going? We love being with you. The problem with God being here in physical form is he could only be at one place at one time. If he goes away in physical form and comes back in spirit, Jesus can be with every single one of you wherever you are on planet earth all the time simultaneously. And Jesus says, this is better. This is better because everyone gets to experience a relationship with me, an intimate relationship with me all the time. So what is the spirit of God? Essentially, the spirit of God is God living in the believer. And now we all have access to that. That's why Jesus says this, this is better. This is a good thing. And the Spirit convicts us. This word conviction is, has been turned into a bad word, right? People leave the church because they feel conviction. I get fun emails about the word conviction. People feel convicted. Corey, we're leaving. I felt convicted. And I read those and I go, I'm doing my job, all right? <laughs> Because the word conviction is not a bad thing. Jesus says the Holy Spirit will convict us about sin, about righteousness, about judgment. The word conviction literally means to convince and correct, to persuade and put on the right path. That's a good thing. It's what the Spirit does. It's what the church should do. It's what we should do with other people. So the Bible defines sin. Here's what the Spirit does. This book, this is called the Bible, this book defines what is right and wrong, right? Blatantly defines, do this, don't do that. Right and wrong is established right here. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict us and give us that feeling. You guys know what I'm talking about? That feeling, that discernment, that feeling in our gut that we are off track. And when we are off track, the Spirit's like, hey, got to get back on track. That leads us back to the truth of the word, back to righteousness, and points us in the right direction. Why? So we will never have to face the judgment of God. This is a good thing. This is all because Jesus loves us, that he gives the spirit to correct us, to convince us so we don't drive off a cliff. So God reaches out to us by the Holy Spirit, fills us with the Holy Spirit, so we can also be a catalyst so other people can feel the conviction of God. Now, again, if we understand conviction in its proper term, that means that we should have a hand in convincing people that the ways of God are better and, and correcting them when they make mistakes, of course, in a loving way. And people get so offended by this. You know, it's like if you're driving a car 100 miles per hour on your way off a cliff and someone takes the steering wheel and, and, and sets you on a course to where you're not going to drive off a cliff, we go... <coughs> I was driving that car. You were right on the way to your destruction. And I love you. And I wanted to help you correct and, and convince you that there is a better way. So listen, here's the thing. As Christians, it is not our job to simply go out in the world and tell everyone how wrong they are. 
That, that's not what we are to do. Of course we are to know what is right and wrong and to communicate what is right and wrong, but it doesn't really do a lot of good if we just run up and go, hey, you're having sex outside of marriage, that's wrong, stop. Now, now we should say something of that nature, but we should explain the why behind the what. We should explain to them the necessity of doing the right thing, the benefit of doing it the way God wants us to do. So if I am teaching my children, I have two daughters, you know, one's a teenager, one's about to be a teenager. If I just say, hey, sex outside of marriage is bad, stop, sex, no, sex is awful, stop it. Well, people who have had sex go, it's actually not that bad, right? It feels pretty good. Um, um, I think I love this person, so, so you know, I don't, I don't know the problem with that. So if I just tell them it's wrong, it's not the complete picture. If I look at them and say, listen, sex is intended to feel good. It's not, it's not a bad thing to have sex within the confines of marriage and a man and woman exclusively for life. But if we go outside of that confine, sex can cause extreme psychological damage to people who are promiscuous. It can cause huge emotional damage to people. It can cause all kinds of physical issues like sexually transmitted diseases and unwanted pregnancies and things like that. So it's not that God doesn't want you to experience pleasure, but outside of God's design, this will take you in a way that is destructive. It will hurt people. So it's not just us going, you're wrong. It's us going, hey, listen, that's not a good choice. Let me show you why. And let me show you what a better choice is. Let me show you the benefit of knowing God and following God. And we convince and we correct, convict them, right? We are also to teach what is right and wrong, righteousness. So we live in a culture of, of self-righteousness. <laughs> self-righteousness is the idea that I can determine what is good and bad, me as an individual. And not only can I determine what is good and bad, every single one of you can have your own version of what is good and bad. This doesn't work on a, on a logical level. So that I can determine what is, what is right, what is wrong. I can determine my own truth. And let me tell you what that's doing to American society right now. It is absolutely destroying it. So as Christians, we are to, to live biblical truth. We are to teach biblical truth. And what we do when we live by the principles of God is we demonstrate to the world around us the power of God. Let me give you an example, a very practical example. So if my wife and I live by the biblical principles of marriage, if I love her like Christ loves the church, if she respects and honors me, if we live the way that we're supposed to live, we have a happy marriage. We have a great marriage. I've been with my wife 26 years, something like that. And, and so, so when my wife and I have a wonderful marriage, people notice it. And they're like, man, you guys like really respect each other and love each other and talk decently to each other and your kids like you and wow, why? <laughs> Well, it's not because my wife and I are perfect. It's because we live by the biblical standards of, of marriage and raising our children. Again, we're not perfect, but living by biblical standards shows the power of God to change us, to have healthy families, healthy marriages. The world sees that and they go, I wouldn't mind some of that. They see the peace that God gives us. So we are to witness, of course, by how we live, but we are also to witness by lovingly, that's an important word, lovingly communicating the truth. Not just hammering people with the Bible, but saying, listen, there's a better way. There's a better way that will give you better results in your life. And so Jesus had a lot more to teach his disciples. I love what he says. He goes, I have a lot more to teach you, but you can't handle it right now. And, and that's because he was, he was giving them a lot of information. Listen, what that's called is that's called progressive revelation. And, and if you've never heard that term before, it's, it's, it's not as fancy as it sounds. What that means is as you spend more time with God, you learn more about God. We can only handle so much at one time. That's why if you buy a Bible, if you buy a Bible and you start at the very beginning, book of Genesis, we know very little about God. All we know about God in Genesis 1 and 2 is that one God created the heavens, the universe, and the earth. That's all we know. He created all the animals, all the vegetation, eventually created humans. That's it. That's all we know about God. But as you read through the Bible, you learn a lot more about God. 
You learn about his nature, his character. You learn about us, our relationship with him. Eventually, we, 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 we see Jesus, which is the visible impression of the invisible God. So we start to see how God interacts with people and, and, and his desire for us and his love for us. And we learn more as it goes on. So if we understand that God gives us information in digestible bites, we need to make sure that when we tell other people about God, that we are patient with them and we give them digestible bites as well. They don't have to have it all figured out instantaneously. We just wanna make sure that we get them on the road, that we get them on the road of learning more. And if they keep walking down that road, they will learn more and more about God. God will reveal things more to them as they can digest it, okay? All right, let's keep moving on. In a little while, you will no longer see me. Again, in a little while, you will see me. Then some of his disciples said to one another, what is this he's telling us? In a little while, you will not see me. Again, in a little while, you will see me. And because I am going to the Father, they said, what is this he's saying in a little while? We don't know what he's talking about. Jesus knew that they wanted to ask him. So he said to them, are you asking one another about what I said? In a little while you will not see me, and again in a little while you will. Truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will become sorrowful, but your sorrow will turn to joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because her time has come. But when she has given birth to a child, she no longer remembers the suffering because of the joy that person has been born into the world. So you also have sorrow now, but I'll see you again. Your hearts will rejoice and no one will take away your joy from you. In that day, you will not ask me anything. Truly, I tell you, anything you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive so that your joy may be complete. So they're very confused still. And we, we have to be a little empathetic with the disciples right here. Imagine, imagine if you're one of the 11, because remember Judas is gone. And Jesus says, hey, listen, you're not gonna see me again. But soon you're gonna see me again. And they're probably like, I don't get it. Uh, I wouldn't have gotten it either. What Jesus is trying to tell them is he's saying, you're about to go through a season. Listen, this is gonna resonate with some of you. Jesus was saying, you're about to go through a season where you think that I'm not, I'm not present. You're gonna go through a season where you're not gonna be able to see me, you're not gonna be able to feel me. But, but hold on, because you will be able to see me again. You will be able to feel me again. What I mean by that, I, anyone who's been a Christian long enough in this room, there have been times where you're like, God, where in the heck are you? And it's in those times, wilderness times is what I call them. It is in those times that we have to hold on to the truth that we know because Jesus will reveal himself again. Jesus will show himself again. So, so even though there will be a time of suffering, confusion, there's also going to come a time, the end result will be clarity. It will be joy. And Jesus is saying, hang on. So as, as time goes on for the Christians, Jesus says this several times in the Gospels, that it is like a woman giving birth. In Matthew chapter 24, in Matthew chapter 24, the disciples ask Jesus, what will the end of time look like? What will it look like right before you come back and save all of us from this world? Jesus says it's gonna be a lot like a woman giving birth. I've never given birth. I've watched my wife do it twice. And, and as the baby is coming out, if I were to be like, hey, you having a really good time? <laughs> Any of you women in this room who have children, you know exactly what I'm referring to here. Yeah, it just gets funner and funner, right? I know that's not a word, but more fun as, as the baby is being delivered. No, of course that's not the case. And this is what it will be like in the life of the Christian. It will become more and more complicated. It will be more and more difficult. We will have more and more suffering that will amplify. But at the end of that suffering, there will be deliverance and it will be the greatest blessing ever. So the question is this, how do we hold on until we are delivered? We hold on by the truth of the word of God. We hold on by the leading of the Holy Spirit. And we hold on by the promises that are in the word of God. 
We're gonna get to a huge promise just at the end of this chapter. But it, it would behoove us, that's a good word, it would, it would be really good for us if we're believers in here. Every once in a while when the world just looks utterly insane, flip to Revelations 19, 20, 21. Flip, flip to the end of the book and, and read that sometimes because it encourages us because we know at the end of it all, Jesus wins. Jesus wins, right? And so we can lean on that and get encouragement from that promise. So there will be suffering, but even before Jesus permanently delivers the, the, the believers from this existence, there is joy in this life, even in the face of suffering. But again, the greater, gri the, the, the greater gift is going to be when Christ comes back takes us to, to heaven, right? Our permanent residency with him. And the Bible says there will, there will be no remembrance of the suffering of this life. Now, I don't know all the ins and outs of that. I think we will remember things from this life. I think we will remember who each other are. I, I believe all that. But, but we will not remember the, the, the pain of that, the, the, the suffering of that. Just like that same woman that if you were to go up to them in the middle of the pregnancy and be like, hey, you having fun? Nope. Once the baby is born, if you go to that same mom and go, hey, do you remember all that suffering? She's not thinking about the suffering. She's just thinking about this beautiful gift. That's what heaven is going to be like. There will be no pain. There will be no sadness. There will be no bad motives. There will be no aggression or hurt or, or any of that in heaven. Those things, were, those things will be gone. And so Jesus probably, I didn't count how many times, probably the third, fourth, fifth time, in a couple of chapters where Jesus says, remember though, you have to live in my will. You have to pray for things in my name. One of the things that he asks them to pray for is joy, that you will receive joy and you will receive complete joy, but you have to ask for that in my name. If you haven't been here, it's not that we can just tag Jesus's name on any prayer and expect to get it. Praying for things in the will of God is asking God for things that he already wants to give you. And when we pray for things that God wants to give us, we get them. One of those things is joy. It is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It is a part of being in a relationship with Jesus. And if we ask God for contentment and peace and joy, he gives us those things regardless of the situation because he wants us to experience a complete Joy, something to remember as times get tough. We are also to be people of courage, of clarity. That was the first thing we talked about. Now let's talk about courage. I have spoken these things to you in figures of speech. A time is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures, but I will tell you plainly about the Father. On that day, you will ask in my name, and I'm not telling you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father, and I have come into the world, and again, I am leaving the world and going back to the Father. His disciples said, look, now you're speaking plainly, and not using any figurative language. Now we know that you know everything and don't need anyone to question you. By this we believe that you came from God. Jesus responded to them, do you now believe? Indeed, an hour is coming and has come when each of you will be scattered to his own home and you will leave me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. This is the important part. You will have suffering in this world. Be courageous. I have conquered the world. So Jesus spoke figuratively. Jesus spoke figuratively a lot. He spoke in parables. Again, all of chapter 15 is figurative. I am the vine, you are the branches. He's not literally a vine. We are not literally branches. It's a figure of speech. So Jesus was saying the time is coming when I'm not gonna speak like that to you anymore. I'm gonna be very blunt. I'm gonna be very straightforward. Now the time that Jesus is referring to was a, was a literal period of time. This is kind of neat and it's kind of a spoiler alert if you've never heard this, but 
Jesus is arrested, he is crucified, he is in the ground for three days. He resurrects and he doesn't just like split after the resurrection. It says he goes back to his disciples and for 40 days, he instructs his disciples. He tells them everything that he wants, uh, that, that he wants them to know. So that 40 day span is from the resurrection to when the Holy Spirit is poured out on all people and that's in Acts chapter two. Here's what is interesting. Pre the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, the disciples, and I don't mean this disrespectfully, the disciples were ignorant and they were cowardly. Ignorant and cowardly. Look, before the cross, ignorant and cowardly. After the cross, the disciples become clear, clear of thought, knowledgeable. They become faithful and they become powerful. What happened? Three things happened. So we learn from the gospel of John that we are incapable of understanding God, understanding the will of God, understanding our place in the universe, unless three things happen. First, we have to believe in Jesus's work on the cross. That's the first step. We have to not only believe that Jesus died for our sins, but, but that we are reconciled with God if we believe in that, if we put our hope in the work on the cross. It's not by our work, it is by his work. If we believe in the work of the cross, if we genuinely give our life to Christ, Ephesians 1.13 says we are sealed by the promised Holy Spirit. Now we don't need to just possess the Spirit, we need to pray that God fills us with the Spirit. That's the second thing. The third thing is we must spend time with Jesus. This is what happened to the, to, to the, to the 11 disciples. Really, remember, Judas is gone. So the 11 disciples, they, they experienced the cross. They were infilled with the Holy Spirit. And for 40 days, Jesus taught them. They spent time with Jesus in conversation. This is what all of us are supposed to do. Believe in the work of the cross. Be full of the Spirit of God. Spend time with Jesus. Pray and listen. Because in the absence of a relationship with Jesus, this is important, in an absence in a relationship with Jesus, we are in confusion and chaos. Case in point, the United States of America. Listen, it, it, is, not, it is not by chance or happenstance or, or it's not just a, a coincidence. The New York Times wrote a story about this last week, actually, that, 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 that religion, especially Christianity, is plummeting at a rate that we have never, ever seen before. It is not a coincidence that as Christianity tanks in the United States, that absolute chaos ensues in society around us. You guys notice this? We have become a bizarre people. We're not just a little sinful, a little lustful, a little hedonistic. We're nuts. Seriously. We believe in nut stuff, crazy stuff, crazy, crazy stuff. But here's the thing, in the absence of truth, what dominates? Lies. This is the world you're living in right now. So verse 28, Jesus says something very simple but very profound. This is called Christology, which is basically like a 30,000 foot view of who Jesus is. Jesus says he is from the Father. The Greek word is homoousios. He is from the Father. He came in the flesh. He died for our sin. He rose from the grave and he ascends back to the Father. He says this and the disciples go, oh, we got it. You don't have to say anymore, Jesus. We got it figured out. We, we got it taken care of. They claim to understand. But here's the problem. At this point, the disciples hadn't been given the Holy Spirit yet because Christ had not been crucified. So they didn't understand. It's the same thing today. There, there are men and women who have PhDs in this book, right? PhDs in this book. But they approach it simply as a literary work of art. They simply approach it from an intellectual standpoint. And, and we can approach it that way, but without the Holy Spirit, we miss the main point of this book. So at this point, the disciples were like, oh, we get it. You're from the Father. We got it. You don't have to say anything more but they didn't get it yet. They were still missing the point because they didn't have the spirit. And what they were doing was, is they were, they were, they were self-assured. They were very confident in themselves. 
And so they, they, they said, Jesus, we get it. The older I get, the more cranky I am, especially with younger people. Does anyone else, as they're getting older, realize this? You try to explain to someone what they're, and they're, oh, da, 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 I got it. And you're like, okay. Then you step back and you watch them like, you know, break whatever it is they're working on or screw up whatever they're, they're doing. And um, this is essentially what Jesus does here. They go, oh, we got it. And he goes, you do, huh? Well, pretty soon you're gonna run for your life. That's what they do. Pretty soon they're gonna scatter when the pressure came. You know what we learned from that? When we lean on our understanding, when we don't think we can be taught, when we, when we are too full of hubris and arrogance to humble ourselves and learn, especially from God, when we say really asinine, ridiculous things like, I just follow my heart. Well, the Bible says your heart is disgusting and evil. Jeremiah says there's nothing more deceptive about you than your heart. The Bible says there is no good in you apart from him. You want to know the worst advice you can ever follow? Follow your heart. I know it's what all your pop songs say and Disney says it and, you know, some person on TikTok, follow your heart. You know, like, don't do that. <laughs> if you follow your heart, you're going to cheat on your husband. If you follow your heart, you're going you're to get enamored with some kind of product and spend money that you don't have. If you follow your heart, you're going to get in deep, deep trouble. That's why the Bible says don't follow your heart. Follow the Holy Spirit that should reside in your heart. When we look to ourselves for direction and assurance and answers, it is a surefire path to chaos. Again, case in point, the culture we live in right now. The same people that say follow your heart and follow us have now created a scenario to where we are killing ourselves, literally suicide, is higher in every demographic of people than it ever has been since we've recorded records. There is more divorce, there is more aggravated assault, there is more violence, there is more everything right now in a negative connotation. The more and more we say we have it figured out, the more obvious it is that we don't have it figured out. So Jesus says, listen, there will be, he goes on, he ignores the disciples, we got it, okay. He continues on. He says, in this life, there will be suffering. There will be suffering in this world. This works on a couple of different levels. The first way it works is this. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are, you're going to suffer in some capacity in this life. No one gets out of this life unscathed. I don't care if you are the greatest Christian that's ever lived, you're not impervious to getting cancer. You may get cancer. You may die of cancer. It doesn't matter how good of a person you are, you may have a spouse that has an affair on you and leaves you. It doesn't matter how good you are, it doesn't matter how perfectly you raise your children, they may rebel against you and God, and they may live a life that, that you didn't teach them to live. These things are going to happen. Why? Because the Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. It's just life. Sin was introduced into this life, and until Jesus comes back, there will always be brokenness in the world, and we will feel that. It also works on that level. It works on this level uh, uh, as well, that if we have an allegiance to Jesus and we do live righteously, that will garner hatred. Jesus said, don't be surprised when they hate you. They hated me first. So he was perfect, and they hated him. People will hate us because of our faith. Another way that this phrase works, in this life there will be suffering, or in this world there will be suffering, is if we adopt the principles of the world, that will bring on unneeded suffering to us. What do I mean by that? Earlier we were talking about if I live by, if my wife and I live by the Bible's principles of marriage, we'll have a good marriage. On the flip side of that, if I live by the world's principles of marriage, I'll probably end up divorced. I'll probably end up hurting my children. We'll probably end up having a huge, nasty feud. It will not work out the way, and suffering that I didn't need to suffer will come on me because I lived by the principles of the world. So we have to understand, the Christian life is fulfilling, the Christian life is good, the Christian life is not easy. It is difficult, Jesus says. In this life, there will be suffering. But he says, be courageous. If we have courage in the face of suffering, if we follow Jesus Christ in the face of the chaos, we have peace. Why? Because Jesus' principles work. 
They work on all levels. Listen, they don't only work in relationships and our relationship with him. They even work in practical levels like with our finances. If, if the U.S. government followed the Bible's teachings on finances, we wouldn't be in the mess that we're in right now. Because the Bible says the debtor is slave to the lender. It tells us not to be materialistic. It tells us for the love of money is the root of all evil. If we followed the Bible's teachings on things like that, most of us wouldn't be in the predicaments financially that we are in right now. And so we have peace because we follow his teachings, his principles. We believe in the work on the cross. And that, and that, that the ruler, I said it earlier, remember this, Jesus said earlier, the devil's already been judged. We, we already know what's going to happen. The ruler of this world has already been conquered, chaos, suffering. Jesus says, I've already, I've already overcome all this. So if we live by Jesus's principles now, we conquer the evil that, that, that comes to tear us up and our marriages and our families and our friends. We live to where we are, we, are, we are insulated from that destruction in this life. And then we also understand that for eternity, Jesus conquers all. I said earlier, if you go back to the end of Revelation, the, the, I, don't, I don't know if I said this earlier, the, 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 the final battle of good and evil is pretty anticlimactic. All the evil armies of the world are lined up. They're going to fight Jesus. Jesus comes back, and it's not really much of a fight. It's not like John Wick or anything like that, right? <laughs> that guy's seen John Wick. I've seen all of them. Anyways, <laughs> it's not like that. It, it, Jesus comes back. All the evil armies of the world are right there. And all it says is Jesus opens his mouth. <laughs> and all of the evil in the world is obliterated. By that same mouth, he speaks all of them into eternal damnation so they will never bother us again. With that same word, right? With that same authority, that same conquering word of Christ, the same universe and earth that he spoke into existence, it says in Revelation, he will speak out of existence and then he will create a new heavens, new universe, new earth. And a new Jerusalem will come down and rest on that earth and we will reside there forever. He, he wins. He conquers all. So because we understand that, or at least I hope we understand that, we need the Spirit to lead us. We need God's Spirit to lead us. The Spirit seeks to convince and correct. Convince and correct. Why? Because Jesus loves you. <laughs> he loves me. He wants to convince us that he's the right path because he loves us. He wants to correct us because he doesn't want us to go to hell. He doesn't want us to be eternally separated from him. He wants us to be with him. So if we have genuinely given our hearts to God, conviction is not a bad thing. We should welcome that conviction because without the conviction of the Holy Spirit in us, we have no compass. We have no way to navigate life. Without the work of the Holy Spirit, discernment, wisdom, knowledge, these are gifts of the Holy Spirit. Without these things working in us, we don't know where to go. We don't know how to make the proper decisions. We don't know to go back to the word of God and build our life around these principles. We need that compass. And so if one is following the Spirit, we will go back to this. We will go back to biblical living. And when we live like the Bible tells us to live, people will notice. We will demonstrate the power of God in our life. We will demonstrate the peace of God in our life and people will notice. Here's the catch. When we live by the principles, they don't run parallel, they run perpendicular to the ways of the world. And when we live by the principles of Christ, eventually it will collide with the ways of the world. And the result will be societal, and physical persecution. Well, Corey, I just don't see that happening. Then you're not looking. You're not looking. Eventually, there will be a collision course. It has happened so many times in history, and it will happen in the United States. It's already starting to happen in the United States right now. I ask you this question a lot, but I'm going to ask it again. Are our hearts prepared for that? Honestly, are we prepared for it? Are we prepared to be banned from the world's synagogues? Are we prepared to even possibly be physically hurt for our faith? 
in those times of suffering, though, we have to lean on the truth of the word of God and we have to remember the promises of God. We should always be growing in our knowledge of truth because the truth sets us free. And we should also be, be growing and maturing in how we live out the truth. So here's the thing. Jesus doesn't expect us all to get it instantaneously, but Jesus does expect us to constantly be growing in our maturity and knowledge and understanding of him. So that doesn't mean we compare ourselves to each other. There's some of you in this room, you are way ahead of me spiritually. You're traveling a traveling thousand miles per hour towards Jesus all the time. You've been doing it for decades. You're way out in front. And then there are some of you that may be way behind me. You may be traveling 35 miles per hour towards Jesus. But the point is not to compare ourselves to where all of us are on the road. The point is, is that we're all on the road. Is that we're traveling on that road. Because listen... Whether we're doing it a million miles per hour because we're smart and, and, and we just have the discipline or because, you know, maybe we struggle a little bit and we're not as sharp. The point is, is that if this is evil and that's Christ, that we're moving further away from this and closer and closer to him. The fancy church word for that is sanctification, right? That we are moving closer to him, further away from sin. And so it is in the truth and the promises of the word. It is in the direction and guiding of the spirit that we are able to weather this life. Not only make it through this life, but at the end of it, remember the, 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 the woman who gives birth, not just that I make it through the pain, but I get this wonderful gift. Our wonderful gift is eternity with Christ. Eternity with God. And if we will hold on and if we will seek the Spirit, allow the Spirit to work, lean on the truth, lean on the promises of the Word, we receive clarity. Clarity on, on who God is, clarity on how we are to live, clarity on how we endure hardships and find our true identity and value is contingent on three things. I already said it, but I'm gonna say it one more time. The first one is we must believe in the work of Jesus on the cross. Jesus died on the cross because he loves me. He paid for my sins if I accept that. He has opened up the path for me to be reconciled with God. We have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. If we call on Jesus, his spirit is with us. We need to ask God to fill us with that spirit. And if we spend time with Jesus in prayer, talking to him, reading the word of God and meditating. If it's your first time here, I don't mean this in an Eastern philosophical manner. I mean that we think on God. As David said in the Psalms, we, we are still sometimes and we just know that he's God. We meditate on him. We ponder on him. We think on him. We receive clarity. And when we have clarity, listen, it all connects. If we have clarity on who God is, we then have courage. We have strength, we have endurance, we have courage to live the way we're supposed to live, to help others live the way they're supposed to live. And this is only possible if we understand that Jesus has conquered the world. That Again, that works in two ways. We have to, we have to believe that Jesus' principles conquer the principles of the world. Listen, that means we have to be convinced that though it is not easy to live the way the Bible tells us to live, it is the correct way, it is the right way, and it is better for us. Sometimes we, we, we say that, but we don't believe it. We buy into the world's lies that if I just looked like this or owned this or if I just had X amount of little you know, hearts on my Facebook page, if I, if I had, then, I would, then things will be better. And we have to understand that, 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 that Jesus' ways are better than those ways. Jesus' ways of marriage and sex and community and Jesus' ways of all the different things the Bible talks about are, are better than the world's principles. We have to believe that. We also have to believe that when it's all said and done, that when it's all said and done, that Christ reigns forever, that he wins, that he holds all power. And if we believe these things, listen to me, if we believe these things, if we live in Christ, we have absolutely nothing to be afraid of. 
Does that mean that we're perfect all the time? No, of course not. Does that mean that there aren't moments in our life that are scary? Of course there are. Several years back, I had a cancer scare. I had to have a mass removed under my, my armpit about the size of a racquetball. And I remember when I went to the doctor and they said, this is probably cancer. It wasn't, by the grace of God. But I remember the first time hearing that word and being like, what? I think I was 39 years old, I'm 43 now. And you're like, I'm not that old. And, and, and so there are times when we get scared. Listen, anxiety. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says to be anxious in nothing. Easier said than done, right? There are times when anxiety wells up. There are times in my life when anxiety starts to well up. Here's the thing. It's not that there's, there, there's not going to be moments where fear creeps in or anxiety creeps in or hopelessness creeps in. That's not the question. The question is where will we run when fear and anxiety and hopelessness creep up? Where will we go? Will we run to porn? Will we run to a bottle? Will we run to a joint? Will we run to a pill? What will we run to? You know what the Bible says? Be anxious for nothing. You know the next part? But in all things, pray. You know what that's saying? In those moments of fear, in those moments of anxiety, we have to bring those things to Jesus. Why? Because he's conquered. He's won. Do you know what else the Bible says? The Bible says that we have not been given a spirit of fear. It goes on to say, but you have been given a spirit of sound mind, clarity, and power, courage. You have not been given a spirit of fear. Do you know the Christian is not designed to live in fear? Not of governments, not of economic situations, not even of physical persecution. Is it easy? No. But in those times when it wells up, we have to take it to the Lord. Why? Because he wins. He wins. He wins now and he wins forever. And if we're living in him, we win now. And we win for, for, for forever. Would you bow your heads with me, please?